Welcome! For the next classes, we'll be looking at economic growth over periods of 40, 50, or even 100 years. Our focus will be on GDP for the reasons we pointed out before. GDP is a good proxy for welfare. But GDP is just a number, which hides very different economic dimensions along which a given economy can be performing better or worse. In order to see this, notice that we can decompose GDP per capita as a product of a series of ratios. As we can see in this table, GDP per capita can be written as GDP per hour's work times hours work per employment times employment over the labor force times labor force over the population with working age times population with working wage over total population. The advantage of doing so is that each of the ratios has an economic interpretation and illustrates different dimensions of the economy. Looking at GDP per hour's worked, we get a measure of productivity. It could be that the economic performance of two countries essentially differs because they have different productivity levels. Or maybe two countries are able to produce the same amount of wealth per hour worked, but one country lags the other because labor market dynamics are different. This can explain partially the difference between Japan and the Eurozone GDP, as hours worked per employee are much higher in Japan. It cannot explain, though, the difference between Germany and Portugal, for example, as Portuguese employees actually work more hours than their German counterparts. In some cases, substantial differences can arise regarding the efficiency of labor markets in getting a job to everyone who wants to work. Unemployment close to 20% is something only saw in the US in the context of the Great Depression of 1929 and the Great Recession of 2008. In Spain, it is a Tuesday. Or it could be that countries differ a lot in participation rates. This is certainly the case when we contrast European with African countries, for example, where women labor market participation is much lower. Not because they work less, but because they participate more in informal labor markets like home production and others which are not captured by GDP. Finally, it could also be that differences in economic performance in GDP per capita between two countries arise because they have different age, and age dependency ratios. If one country has a high proportion of retired people, ceteris paribus, there will be less people working and creating wealth. This decomposition is important because it serves as a first diagnostic tool regarding how a country is performing along different dimensions and can inspire policies that can promote growth and welfare. However, as we mentioned at the beginning, we are now concerned about economic growth over large periods of time. And it should be in everyone's mind that, at least in developed economies, almost every single person has living standards well above the richest person on the planet in the 19th century. If you have doubts about that, just imagine what it was like to visit the dentist back then, or have a surgery, or die of diseases such as tu tuberculosis and other ailments that are harmless today due to the availability of antibiotics. Economics in the 19th century was known as the dismal science, following the observation by Malthus that population growth was not accompanied by proportional increases in availability of fertile land for food production. The consequence was, Malthus argued, that the future would bring hunger, famines, and war over every more scarce resources. Unlike Malthus' predictions, today, not only people are getting more overweight, about 40% of food produced in developed economies go to waste. So what did Malthus miss? Productivity, the ability that workers with the same amount of resources can produce much more today than they did 200 years ago. If we look at the evolution of GDP since the year 1000, we see that GDP was essentially flat up to the 1700s. People lived and died in societies that look pretty much the same from birth to old age. But then, improving, improvements in technology brought by the industrial, industrial revolutions started a period of increase in productivity. This is the amount of wealth each worker could produce that far outweighed the increases in population. 
Today, just think about what someone like my 91-year-old grandmother lived through. When she was young, people were so poor in her village that they would share embers from house to house to light the fire because matches were expensive. No sanitation, paved roads or electricity. Today, she has a mobile phone with unlimited internet traffic and flat screen TV in her bedroom. Ultimately, it is productivity. The ability to, with the same resources, create more and more wealth. That has been the main driver of secular increases in living standards. If we look at the US since 1960s, GDP per capita seems to grow along a stable growth path. And as we can see in this plot, productivity growth is the main source of GDP growth. We do see increase in participation rates relating to women's entry into the labor market, but none of these can explain sustained increases in living standards through time. And when we think of the determinants of long-run productivity growth, the first that comes to mind is precisely technological progress. The ability to discover new ways of, with the same resources, produce more output. Since 1980s, that improvement in information and communication technologies led to the creating of an increasingly interconnected world. Words like globalization, websites, mobile phones, and conference calls became part of our common lexicon and led to dramatic increases in global welfare there since. The COVID-19 pandemic only contributed to accelerate the ubiquity of these technologies in all spheres of our lives. Work relations, entertainment, social interactions, purchasing behavior, and so forth. However, this is just the last step in a chain of innovation that led to technological breakthroughs that go back to the first industrial revolution in the 1700s. Back then, the start of mechanization in industries such as textiles led to dramatic increase in yields. Later on, the steam power engine, railroads, the first instant communication technology, the telegraph, led to even more possibilities. Since then, it has only accelerated. It is amazing when we think that the younger of the Wright brothers, Orville, died when Neil Armstrong, the first man to step on the moon, was already 18 years old. More recent technologies include cloud computing, virtual reality, and nanotech, all of which already have a presence in our daily lives. However, it is important to note that technological progress of this magnitude is the exception rather than the rule when you think in terms of historical times. Up to the 1700s, people would live their whole lives without any significant change. Also, think that it took about 52 years to go from flying the first airplane to putting the first man in space and another 12 years to reach the moon. One could argue that indeed, the world changed a lot more between 1900 and 1969 than it has changed since 1969 until today. The period of slow growth after the Great Recession also contributed to some scholars thinking that the golden age of compounding innovation was coming to an end. Others think that such exception times are still far from being over. On one side, the pessimists typically note that labor productivity has been slowing down in the US. From the plot on the left, we can see how early technological features have led to dramatic increase in GDP per capita. But these seem to have slowed down since the 50s. Optimists, on the other side, note that if we look at the impact of information technologies since their inception in 1970s, the increases in labor productivity remarkably resemble the same impact that electrification did in the beginning of the 1890s, suggesting that indeed our best days are yet to come.